Hello, my name is Brian Richter, and I'm the Chief Scientist for the Global Water Program of the Nature Conservancy. I'm also proud to be a board member of the River Network, your host and producer for today's webinar on environmental flows. So just a quick overview of what we're going to try to cover in this webinar. Um, I want to start with just a, a general basic definition of what environmental flows mean. Say a little bit about why we should care about them, uh, why they have become a, a, an issue of concern in many parts of the United States and in the world. Say a little bit about this concept of how much water does the river need? Uh, how, do we, how do we conceptualize that? And as scientists, how do we begin to quantify those needs? And uh, so that's the part that I'll wrap up with. I'll say a little bit more about some of the scientific methods and options that are available for defining an e-flow needs. Uh, and then at the end of the webinar, I will uh, offer a couple of references uh, for those of you that might want to follow up and get more information on this topic. So starting with a basic definition of environmental flows, and there are many of them that are available and that you can find on the internet, this one happens to have come from an international conference on environmental flows that was convened in Brisbane, Australia back in 2007. And it's probably the most commonly cited definition. And I like this one, not just, just because I had something to do with its writing, but also because I think it covers some really key points. So as it says here, environmental flows considers the, the quantity, the timing, and the quality of water flows required to sustain freshwater and estuarine ecosystems and the human livelihoods and well-being that depend, depend upon these ecosystems. So if you saw that I emphasized a couple of the phrases there. I think um, many times uh, there's a misconception that environmental flow advocates or scientists are not considering the interaction between flow or flow patterns or flow quantity and water quality, and that is most definitely the case, or should be in all cases, that environmental flows are important to both fresh water and that includes both flowing water systems as well as wetlands and, and floodplains and, and other aspects of freshwater systems and lake systems and, and underground groundwater systems, by the way, as well. But also a very important uh, consideration when we're talking about estuarine ecosystems and support of shellfish uh, and, and fishing activities and that sort of thing. And the last part of this definition that I think is so important is that um, environmental flows is not concerned just with fish and frogs and water birds, but instead it's also very important to sustaining human livelihoods for many people in our world who depend directly upon ecosystems uh, for their food security, um, but also our overall well-being, whether we want to recreate um, or, or just enjoy the aesthetic beauty and, and some of the spiritual and cultural values of freshwater and estuary systems. So also important to recognize right up front that there are many processes and conditions, factors that influence the overall health of freshwater ecosystems um, and, and their ability to support uh, the diversity of life that's dependent upon aquatic and riparian and estuary habitats. So the physical habitat itself, uh, you know, the shape of the river, the depth of the river, or of the other water body, uh, those are very, very important. How that shape changes in response to uh, different influences, and, and including flow regime. Uh, the overall biological composition and interactions, this is a particular concern with is there enough food available within the system to support the entire food chain. It's also important from the standpoint of are there invasive um, species that are present that can become more dominant or problematic uh, if the overall health of the system is, is not um, in good shape. This issue of connectivity, uh, can organisms move upstream and downstream the system that they need to? But con connectivity is also important to processes like sediment transport, can sediments move from the upper part of a watershed to the lower part of the watershed? Um, and can nutrients and, and organic matter flow downstream with flowing water systems? Uh, this, again, is important to other types of systems as well as wetlands and lakes. 
uh, are, have issues of connectivity as well. And then you see it down in the bottom right, the water chemistry, the water quality regime. So all aspects of the quality of the water being very, very important to this. But of course, this is going to be focused uh, more acutely on the issue at the top, hydrologic regime. And again, thinking about it in its broadest context, how much water is flowing on the surface and what's the pattern, the timing, the volume of that water flow, what are the groundwater contributions, uh, surface inundation on floodplains or around the fringes of wetlands and lakes, and also the soil moisture conditions, um, all being influenced and all part of a very holistic perspective on hydrologic regime that we need to be considering as we talk about environmental flow. And so again, I'm going to, to spend most of this webinar talking about hydrologic regime and how do we get our heads around trying to quantify uh, the necessary hydrologic regime or what we call environmental flows. So this slide is just another way of representing the previous slide, and but, but makes the point that the flow regime has a very strong influence on these other five components um, of an ecological system that, that all contribute toward overall ecological health and ecosystem services. And for that reason, many scientists a couple of decades ago began referring to the flow regime as the master variable in freshwater ecosystems. Uh, one of my favorite Australian scientists, Keith Walker, um, also referred to this as the maestro of the freshwater orchestra. I thought that was a very eloquent, colorful way of describing it. Um, so flow regime has a lot of influence on all these factors, a lot of interactions, all of which, of course, makes it challenging to think about uh, what kind of a flow regime precisely do we need to sustain all of these things that go into ecological health. So before I get into the science, let me just say a little bit about uh, why this issue has emerged, why so many scientists and river conservationists are concerned about environmental flows these days. And it really goes straight to the issue of how we're using our water resources, both here within the United States and around the planet. Um, this image, this map, is a representation of all the places in the world where the available renewable water resources are being depleted by 75% or more. And so what that means is that we're taking water, we're extracting water out of the freshwater sources, and we're putting it to use, and that water's not getting returned um, immediately or in proximity to where it's being extracted, and therefore it is a loss to the local hydrologic system, what we call consumptive use or depletion of the, of the water source of the hydrologic system. And so these places, we are pulling water out and consuming it at a pace that causes these systems to be depleted by more than 75%, either on an ongoing basis in, in terms of the deep red colors here during certain times of the year as represented by the orange color, or during dry years or droughts as represented by the yellow colors. So when you add this up, about it, it, it translates into about a third of all the freshwater sources on our planet are being heavily depleted. Um, and as a result, we're experiencing water scarcity, uh, water shortages, a lot of competition, a lot of conflict over those available water supplies, causing a great deal of economic damage, great deal of social and cultural strife, um, and even causing and leading to conflicts among nations that share the same water sources. So that's a great concern to us. Um, I think a lot of you watching this webinar are also concerned about the fact that when you take more than 75% of the water away from something like a flowing river, um, you can most definitely count on the fact that it's having a pretty severe ecological impact as well. So that's one of the reasons that we're very concerned. There is a, a, another side to the coin of this, of this image here, and that is that in the gray areas, representing about two-thirds of all the water sources on our planet, 
the water extractions and consumptive use are actually still quite light um, by comparison. And so for me, as a lifelong river conservationist, um, it brings me some relief that at least two-thirds of the water sources on our planet are not experiencing these, uh, these great alterations, this great obstruction and, and reduction in the flow regime, in the environmental flows that are needed to sustain these ecosystems. And, and so I've been working with a number of researchers around the world and a lot of students uh, at, at universities, particularly here in Charlottesville, Virginia, where I teach a class in, in uh, the University of Virginia. And we've been compiling a lot of data trying to connect water scarcity or water depletion, as we used on that previous map, with the occurrence of water shortage impacts. So impacts on economies, on agricultural production, on electricity generation, on drinking water supplies, and also, importantly, on environmental health or, or freshwater ecosystems. And these divisions that are shown here and the numbers that are represented here are not hard and fast lines. Um, in fact, this is a very blurry continuum, and it is a continuum. And, but what we are starting to see from the, from the mounting evidence coming in again from across the U.S. and around the world is that as you start to cross the line of taking out 10 to 20 percent of the renewable flows of water moving through freshwater sources, we do start to see measurable, detectable ecological impacts. What that means is changes in the population of freshwater species, or it mean, actually may mean the local loss, the extirpation of certain highly sensitive species, species that can't tolerate much change in the flow regime and the associated ecosystem conditions that are related to and dependent upon flow regime. As you get into a further level of impact on those freshwater sources, when you're extracting, say, something like half or more, then you start to see real impacts show up in terms of ecosystem services. So it might mean that we don't have enough water to uh, supply hydroelectric power dams. We may not have enough water to use in cooling other types of power plants, like a coal-fired or a natural gas-fired power plant. Uh, because the river levels have dropped so low that they can't extract enough water to keep those plants cool and maintain their full operation. It might also mean that we don't have enough fresh water flow moving downstream into coastal systems, into estuaries, uh, to maintain the proper salt concentrations, the salinity conditions that are necessary to support those estuarine uh, species populations, uh, shellfish, fish. Uh, aquatic plants, mangroves, uh, uh, marshes, that kind of thing. And then when we get to an extreme level of extraction of water from a freshwater source, that's when we start to see very severe economic impacts and uh, national security or international security consequences and conflicts. Um, so we see things like um, agricultural production uh, not being able to uh, be maintained because there's simply not enough water available within the system uh, to meet all needs, all demands for all users. It may even mean that uh, we have to shut down or reduce the production in manufacturing plants, industrial facilities, mining operations, that kind of thing. But again, just to recap from the environmental standpoint, um, a key point to make here is that as you start to move from 10 or 20 percent uh, reduction in the flow, or changes in the natural patterns of flow, as we'll get to here in a moment, then we should suspect that there are likely ecological alterations, ecological damage uh, beginning to appear, and it only gets worse as you move further and further across this continuum. So one other high-level point that I want to emphasize here is that Hydrologic systems are naturally quite variable. Um, we don't have the same amount of water flowing down a river from day to day, month to month, um, and certainly not from year to year. And this graph represents this issue for a smallish creek um, that's in southwestern Georgia, um, Itchaway-Nachaway Creek. And 
This graph, for those of you that aren't familiar with looking at this graph, it's called a box and whisker graph. And essentially, um, there is a horizontal line in each of the boxes that represents the 50th percentile or the median condition. You might think about that as being the average condition. About half of the days or half of the months above that line have a greater flow, and about half of them have a lesser flow um, in this case. And so, and then the extreme ends of the bars, where you have the lines going up uh, both above the box and below the box, really represents kind of the extremes in the variation that goes on within any given month. And so a couple key points to make out of this graph. One is that uh, the flow conditions naturally in this system uh, prior to significant human impacts varied quite a lot from month to month. There were dry years and there were wet, wet years. And that happened, and you see that variability in each and every month of the year to some extent. The other point to make here is that in this particular region of Georgia, a lot of irrigated, a lot of agriculture began to be, be irrigated beginning in the 1970s and the early 1980s. Uh, there was a lot of groundwater pumping immediately adjacent to this creek um, and uh, to irrigate corn, cotton, peanuts, a lot of other, a lot of other crops that are grown in that part of, of Georgia. And so you see then, by comparing the gray boxes and bars with the red boxes and bars, that there have been consequences on this system. Uh, you just look at the, uh, either the, the median lines, the horizontal lines, or look at the size and the positioning of the boxes. You see that overall, there's been a general decline in flow, um, really in every month of the year. And that um, a great concern in this system is that during the summer months, uh, particularly May through September or October, the effect of the groundwater extractions um, in areas adjacent to the stream are causing the stream to go nearly dry um, during some years. So really depressing the available water moving downstream. And that's a, a quite a bit of concern from an ecological standpoint for its ability to sustain the fish, the freshwater mussels, and, uh, and other aspects of the aquatic habitat in this system. And so the point here is that we need to be paying attention to both natural variability when we're talking about environmental flow and also about human modified variability in, in flow regime conditions as a way of understanding what might be going on or what we need to do in terms of setting an environmental flow standard or trying to restore the environmental flow conditions in a river. So then let's jump to this question about how much water does a river need. Uh, this is a question that I posed in a, in a paper back in 1997. Um, but scientists have been trying to address this question for a very long time. Um, here in the United States, there was actually some terrific work done by a, by a gentleman by the name of Donald Tennant. Donald Tennant worked for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And as a lot of big dams were getting built across the United States in the 1950s and the 1960s, Donald Tennant got very concerned, uh, being a passionate uh, river biologist. And uh, he saw a lot of these streams getting heavily altered and, and not much water flow being released from the new dams that were being built. And so Donald set out and did an extensive, comprehensive survey of hundreds of rivers and streams um, across a good swath of the United States and came up with his general rules about how much water needed to be maintained within the river systems to maintain their health, their ecological health. And so again, Donald Tennant was doing his work back in the 50s and the 60s, published a, a paper that, that led, gave rise to what was called the Tennant Method, Rules of Thumb about water protection for environmental flows. It was published back in the 1970s. So this is not a new area of science. It's not a new area of concern. Uh, here in the United States, it dates back a half a century at least. Uh, but there has been a lot of, of advancement in the science behind environmental flows, particularly within the last couple of decades. I think we saw a real burst of activity beginning in the late, late 1980s. And so some of the things that I'll be talking about and sharing with you today, of course, are, are, um, are fairly recent ideas, concepts, and developments that have taken place in the last couple of decades. 
So one of these was uh, in that paper, which was titled, How Much Water Does a River Need? Uh, we, we addressed the question um, kind of straight out and said, well, if you're really talking about it from a conservation science perspective, if you're, talking, if you're trying to answer that question in its fullness um, and say, well, how much of the flow regime do you need to preserve if you're going to try to keep everything intact and in a high level of ecological health, then the basic answer is you pretty much need just about all of it. Um, you need, uh, you know, close to the full volume, and you need the full range of variation that we just talked about a couple slides ago um, in those hydrologic regimes, and you need to pay attention to these characteristics of the timing of flow conditions. How long do certain flow conditions last? How often do they occur? How fast do things change from one flow level to another flow level? And we just said those things are all important and you really need to pay attention to all of them if you're really concerned about the full biodiversity and ecological integrity of these aquatic systems. And that gave rise, uh, you know, there, there was a lot of work that was taking place around the mid-90s, mid to late 1990s, and we started to recognize these issues of natural flow patterns. There was a lot of pioneering work that was done on trying to say, um, you know, there are these repeating patterns in the overall flow regime of a given river, and those patterns matter. Those patterns have characteristics of volume and timing and frequency and duration. And so we might hear in a sim simple rendition that we, that we uh, published in uh, a book that I wrote with Sandra Postel back in 2003, we used this illustration just to say, for instance, there are naturally low flow conditions during certain times of the year. There are natural high flow pulses, as we refer to them, that might come up from whenever you get a, a burst of rainfall or a, a quick moment of snow melt um, happening in, in mountainous rivers. Uh, but then also we have natural floods that happen over the course of the year or during a certain time of the year. And those things are all important, and again, they each have their own characteristics that we need to be mindful of. And really important to emphasize that no two rivers are the same, uh, unfortunately. Um, we will in a moment talk about groups or types of rivers, but at, at the end of the day, each individual river is unique unto itself. Um, and that includes its flow regime, and in fact, flow regime is again a major driver of that of that individuality, that uniqueness of each river. So you can see here on the right hand side of this of this slide um, some very different looking flow regimes. Um, so of course flows may happen, high flows may happen at different times of the year depending upon when you might have a rainy season. And then you were, when you're in a rain dominated place. Uh, not much snow, snow melt influence, uh, then you may have a river that, that is what we call very flashy. When you get a burst of rainfall, you get a jump up in the river level. And uh, it makes for a very jagged hydrograph, a very jagged flow regime, a hydrograph just being the representation of how much water is moving down the river over the course of the year. Uh, the third graph down is for, you'll see there, is labeled as being from the Yampa River in northwestern Colorado. That's predominantly a snowmelt driven river. So what happens there is that the snowpack accumulates in the mountains, in the Rocky Mountains, over the course of the winter season. And then as the season warms up and that snow starts to melt in the spring and early summer, a lot of that water comes rushing down the Yampa River. So you have a very distinctive signature, a very distinctive flow regime that's easily recognized as being a snowmelt river in that graph of the, of the Yampa River. Lastly on the bottom is um, a very different looking hydrograph, this one for the Mississippi River. And in this one, because it's such a huge river system, what you have is many smaller rivers, some of which are snowmelt rivers, some of which are rain-dominated rivers, but they're all feeding into this one great body of water that we call the Mississippi. And so the, the flows there accumulate gradually and slowly over the course of the year. 
Um, finally building into a peak around the summer season and even into the fall before dropping back off again um, uh, to lower flow conditions during the winter. So again, the point here being that uh, river systems all have their degree of, of uniqueness. And that uniqueness is wonderful in its expression of biological diversity, um, posing challenges for human utilization, um, and also that uniqueness needs attention when we talk about how much water does the river need. So I've touched on a couple of different ways that we humans change those natural flow conditions. And these are just a couple of general categories. So we build dams that capture the flow of a river, store it either temporarily over long periods of time, and then re we release the water according to uh, generally human, human needs, human demands, uh, to generate hydroelectric power, to move water downstream for use in irrigation or for use in cities. So the flow regime of a river below a dam being very strongly dictated by what the human needs of that river system and those water supplies might be. Um, we can also, of course, greatly change the volume of the river by diverting water directly out of the river and putting it on our farms or taking it off to our cities and our industries. We can pump the groundwater system, as I talked about for Ichaway Nachaway Creek in Georgia. We can pump groundwater, and in many cases, that groundwater system was, was connected to and interacting with the surface stream. And therefore, when you pump groundwater, you can have an effect on the surface water flows next to the area of groundwater pumping. Um, changes in the land use over the, the, the river basin, over the watershed, can actually have quite strong influences um, because you're changing the way that rainfall or snow melt interacts with the land and therefore run the, the patterns of the way that it runs off into a river. Lastly, we're all becoming increasingly cognizant of the influence of climate change. Not surprisingly, if you shift the precipitation, if you shift the, the amount or the way that rain falls on a watershed, if you change the amount or the timing of when snow melts in a watershed, that's going to translate into changes in those flow regimes. And so all of these factors need to be taken into, into account. Now, when we're talking about managing for environmental flows, um, I think there is right up front a recognition that um, we're having that discussion because there is either existing human uses and alterations to the flow, or there is a proposal um, to alter uh, the, the flow conditions. And so right away, we're thinking about, we're presented with this question, not so much of, of how much does the river need, but maybe a different way of asking it is, how much alteration in that flow regime is acceptable or tolerable? And of course, right away, uh, we should acknowledge that ex terms like acceptable and tolerable are social constructs or social values. And so answering this question about how much water does the river need or how much alteration is tolerable or acceptable is a question that needs to get worked out with stakeholders, uh, with water users, with people who care about um, our particular river. It's not just a scientific question. But the scientific input into that dialogue is critically important. And so we're going to focus on how that science can contribute. So graphically here, this slide represents the idea that the light gray being maybe the unaltered or more natural light condition, the lighter gray color, and the darker gray here being conceptually, hypothetically, what uh, might be determined as being necessary for ecological maintenance. So right away, you see that there's a difference between the two. And that's the point I'm trying to make. Maybe a lesser volume, but at the same time, trying to maintain some semblance of those patterns of the flow regime, the high flow pulses, uh, the flood conditions, uh, the timing, and the volume of water flows during the low flow season of the year. We need to be thinking about how much change in these flow regimes um, is going to be acceptable to everybody concerned. So I'm going to move now and just touch on 
three very general broad categories of scientific approaches. Um, again, emphasizing that the science uh, analysis is an input to the social dialogue that needs to take place about how to manage for environmental flows. So I'm going to talk about three general categories, as you see here, a presumptive standard, site-specific assessments, which, which are done. They're, they tend to be, as you'll see here in a moment, rather intensive, but focused on a particular river or a particular stretch of a river. And then I'm also going to touch on regional analysis, regional approaches where you're trying to group rivers into individual types, different groups of rivers, and trying to offer flow recommendations by group or by type. And one other thing that's, that I wanted to share with you is um, just some sense of, of some of the decisions that go into um, making a choice, making a selection of which of these approaches to pursue um, or to implement. And a couple key points to make here is that different approaches take a different amount of time to apply or to implement. They have very, very different costs associated with them. And they shouldn't be viewed as being either or decision. And in fact, um, the logic that's suggested by this slide is that you might start with approaches, methods that are can be done fairly quickly and done at a fairly low cost, but then proceed to doing more in-depth study or doing study for more and more rivers over time in an effort toward, build toward building toward a comprehensive environmental flow management program or system, say, within your state government um, and, uh, or, or within a larger river basin. And so these, both the time estimates and the costs are very ballpark. There's great ranges of variability in terms of their application. But hopefully, the time required and the costs that are suggested here give you some feeling for what's involved here. And, and as I get into more detail on each of these methods, you'll understand uh, why it takes more time and, and more money to implement some of these different approaches. One other thing before I leave this slide is, is the bottom box, adaptive management. The point I want to make here is that regardless of the approach that's taken, the method that's applied, it's so important to create the ability to refine your sense of how much water the river needs over time. The science gets better, the social values change over time, the needs, the uses, the demands on the river's water resources will change over time. And all of those things suggest that we need to be able to continuously revisit our decisions that are made by applying these methods and through the social stakeholder dialogue um, and being always mindful of how are we going to do that? How are we going to reopen the decisions? Um, what kind of science or other monitoring is going to be needed to feed that process. So I'm going to jump a little bit out of sequence here and, and start with site-specific um, and, uh, and share a few thoughts about that with you. So there's a lot of different ways to study a particular river to try to analyze its flow requirements. This is a process that we developed about a decade ago um, and we've, we, within the nation of Germany, we refer to this as the Savannah process because we pioneered this approach in our applications to the Savannah River, um, which forms the border between South Carolina and Georgia um, in the southeastern United States. So a simple five-step process that can get really complicated uh, as you work through it. But here's, here's what I wanted to point out. Um, First, the orientation meeting, bringing all the parties, the stakeholder, the interested people together to talk about what's going to be done. Um, the commissioning of an in-depth report, um, very important to figure out who knows what, what work's already been done, what kind of data are already available, and get that summarized in a way that's useful for answering this question of how much water does the river need. Uh, moving then in this particular Savannah process 
Moving into a multi-day workshop that's comprised largely of scientists, but some other stakeholders ideally are involved as well, to come up with an initial set of flow recommendations. Moving then as quickly as possible into implementing those recommendations so that sets up the learning process. Did you get it right? Did we forget some things? Did we understand the system well enough? Um, is this feasible to implement uh, from the water manager standpoint or a dam operator standpoint? And the last box there, monitoring and research, making sure that we have the capabilities in place to learn from the implementation so that we can then feed back and modify the flow recommendations over time. Again, some of the costs associated with this, we can move fairly quickly through setting up and having a discussion in the orientation meeting, taking up to about a year and up to about ninety dollars to $100,000 to commission the report. Typically, we have utilized uh, academics, uh, universities, to prepare those reports for us, but certainly other agencies and organizations can provide that service. Bringing uh, people together in a multi-day workshop, um, there's some costs associated with the logistics and the facilitation of that workshop. Moving into implementation, you will see that the cost there is zero. Now, there's a big presumption there that that means that somebody's already paying for the management of water resources, the operation of a dam. But certainly, let's recognize that any changes to those systems may have cost impl um, implications as well. And then going into monitoring and research, you could spend literally millions of dollars doing that. Um, so these are just averages from our experience in, in many river systems across the United States and globally. Um, this process has been applied by the Nature Conservancy in probably 10 to 15 different river basins to date. So there's been a lot of learning going on, and some of these time and cost estimates reflect what we have learned from that. So I'm going to now touch on uh, this part uh, of the Savannah process for defining flow requirements for a particular river. Um, in our flow recommendations workshop for the Savannah River, um, over a decade ago, we convened a total of 47 scientists um, in that process. And I should say not just scientists, but also some stakeholders. In fact, we included some of the representatives from the Army Corps of Engineers because they operate some dams on the Savannah River that have a big influence on how water flows through the stretch that we were analyzing. And so the scientists spent um, uh, both in the preparation of the summary report that was prepared before the workshop as well as over the course of the workshop and follow-up discussions, prepared a lot of different outputs um, from their analyses, including a conceptual ecological model to try to show here that over the course of the year, as the flow in the Savannah River changes from month to month, um, there are different ecological and biological phenomena that are taking place. American shad are moving into the river and egg laying, and then emigrating out of the river system back out into the coastal areas. That there are certain tree species that are going through the dispersal of their seeds, and the germination and, and growth of the young trees out on the floodplain area. That there are birds moving through the system into the, into the uh, forests and floodplains and wetlands uh, for breeding, nesting, feeding purposes, and that kind of a thing. And so this is just a, a colorful way of representing some of those important processes that were taking place. So the scientists tried to distill as many of those considerations as they could, as much of the data and knowledge that they had available to them, and crunched through that analysis and debated with each other over the course of, of three days. We didn't literally lock the doors, but we certainly maintained their focus on this objective to come up with this end result. Again, a little bit complicated here, so let me piece, piece it out for you a little bit. Obviously, we're talking about what flows are needed over the course of the year, from January through December. And so each of these boxes is a flow recommendation, a part of the puzzle that we are recommending for, for implementation on the Savannah River. You can see over on the left-hand column that we're thinking about low flow conditions, high flow conditions, and floods, and thought about those for every month of the year, although it was only 
some of these issues are only pertinent or relevant, or most important to certain times of the year. And then we talked about three general classes of year types, dry years, average years, and wet years. And so you'll see that we have different recommendations for different aspects of the flow regime and in different year types. And so that's the product of this work. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about one part of that recommendation, um, what we call the high flow pulses. You'll see that the scientists felt that those pulses were very important during the spring season. And they're very important for certain specific ecological outcomes things like dispersing the tree seeds once they come off of the bald cypress and the other tree species and spreading those seeds around the floodplain. It's important to move the young fish larvae as they come out of their eggs and into the, into the water of the river. They need to be transported in some cases for certain species downstream um, so that they can go through their growth cycle and their metamorphosis into becoming juveniles and adults. Um, so you see the different kinds of ecological processes that were considered here. One I'm going to highlight is this one of fish passage um, past an old navigation block and dam on this river system. Uh, it created some hydraulic conditions that were being difficult for particular species of fish, both the shad and also for short-nosed sturgeon, to be able to move from the lower parts of the river up past that hydraulic structure and get up into a shoal area where they would spawn. And so this was a big consideration for us, is how much water needed to be you know, going through that structure during a certain time of the year to enable those fish to get to where they needed to go to reproduce. And so based on that recommendation, um, the Corps of Engineers, uh, we were very pleased to have a very productive collaborative relationship with the Corps of Engineers on the Savannah River and in March 2004, they released their first ever environmental flow release, and specifically a controlled flood out of the upstream dam, specifically out of Thurman Dam, um, upstream of this stretch of river that we were concerned with. And it was a big day. Uh, the general of the, the overall chief of the Corps of Engineers, a gentleman by the name of Carl Strock, um, was present, uh, as well as Colonel Gerber, who was responsible for the Savannah District of the Corps. They were on hand and in front of TV cameras and other media talking about how this was you know, one important aspect of a new era uh, for the Army Corps of Engineers to start paying more attention to what the ecological water needs are of river ecosystems and working with organizations to try to understand what those environmental flow needs, and to try to figure out as a water manager how they might be able to provide for those environmental flow needs. Um, so I mentioned that short-nosed sturgeon were one of the species that uh, we were quite concerned about. And so as a way of monitoring how they would respond to these flow releases, and specifically the high flow pulses, uh, the scientists, the biologists working on the river uh, implanted radio tags in a number of these individual sturgeon in order to track how they would respond and to see whether or not they could get upstream of that hydraulic structure. And I, I, I decided to include this story as a way of emphasizing adapt, the importance of what we call adaptive management, of keeping track of how well things work out. Um, because this was a story that didn't end up so well on the first, on the first try. So when we released that first flow, flow pulse back in 2004, we expected the sturgeon who were hanging out down in the downstream estuary to take advantage of that cue of that higher water coming downriver to swim upstream, get through this hydraulic structure, and go spawn on the shoals. Well, much to our chagrin and embarrassment, um, they did exactly the opposite. They, in fact, moved further out toward the ocean, um, much to our surprise. And, but almost instantaneously, um, a group of the scientists that were working on this problem realized that what had happened was we were re releasing a burst of very cold water out of the upstream dam. Uh, the releases on from Thurman Dam um, come off of the bottom of the dam where, very, where the water is very, very cold. 
And uh, the sturgeon uh, didn't like that fall for cold water and decided it wasn't, in fact, time to reproduce and, and turned away um, from, from the pulse of water. We have since learned as a way of correcting and adaptively managing that we need to wait a little bit further into the spring season, give the upstream reservoir time to warm up before we release these flow pulses so that we won't shock the poor sturgeon in the future. And, and we're, we're getting uh, pretty positive results now that we've figured out that problem. Let me move now to regional approaches to setting environmental flow recommendations. So you have a good sense now as to what's involved in studying a particular river or a particular stretch of a river. But as we started doing a lot of those kinds of studies, as scientists started uh, paying attention to individual rivers in a lot of different places across the US and globally, at the same time, we started to appreciate the fact that those processes were time consuming and expensive. And in the meantime, the human demands on rivers was growing, and in many places, growing quite quickly. And there were going to be a lot of rivers that were going to get further compromised, further depleted, further altered, if we didn't come up with some way to provide flow recommendations for, for many, many rivers at the same time. In other words, we're looking for efficiency in the science in the recommendations. And so we went to a more of a regional-based approach. And let me show you how that works. Uh, we, we produced a method uh, published in 2010 that was called ELOHA, was the acronym, Ecological Limits of Hydrologic Alteration. So basically trying to address the question of how much alteration is acceptable or tolerable primarily through a scientific perspective, but also um, ELOHA. There's no reason why ELOHA can't involve a lot of other stakeholder in, input in the process of, of setting these, um, these targets or setting these limits. Um, and in fact, that is highly desirable um, a, approach to, to use that kind of a inclusive approach in setting these ultimate limits. So it's a regional approach to setting environmental flow standards. This is particularly um, a method that is being used on a state by, statewide basis in a number of different states. Some of the Canadian provinces are picking up on this, um, also being applied in large river basins and in entire country in different places in the world. Um, but as suggested by this map, or the coloration on this map, a fundamental uh, idea behind this approach is that you can classify different rivers and streams into different types. A headwater stream, a lowland floodplain river, um, you know, uh, and, and various different types based on their geologic setting, their flow volumes, the vegetation that grows there, um, and many, many different characteristics of the individual streams and rivers, classifying them into types which gives you then the ability, the ability to say, OK, how much alteration can any particular type of river or stream tolerate before we start to see undesirable changes in the system? So the scientific or ecological theory behind this, uh, represented in fairly simplistic terms here, is that the ecological condition changes or degrades with increasing hydrologic alteration. OK? So from a scientific standpoint, the function of the biotic community uh, changes. Um, the structure, uh, the composition of the biological communities changes. What species you could be found there, and what abundance relative to other species uh, you know, might exist. And so we would expect that. The more you alter the system and its hydrology, its flow regime, the more change you're going to effect in the ecological conditions. But one of the real challenges for scientists is that we don't know the shape of that relationship. And that relationship is going to be very different if you're talking about low flows, high flow pulses, or floods. Um, we don't know if there's a threshold change that you get to a certain degree of hydrologic alteration, and all of a sudden things change drastically. 
or maybe things change very slowly and incrementally as you change the flow characteristic uh, to a greater and greater degree. So as you can imagine, this can be quite a challenge uh, for the scientists that are trying to, to work out these relationships. And again, the idea here of ALOHA is that you work out these relationships for different types or classes of streams and thinking about the different flow patterns within each of those types or classes of streams. And so here's um, an example. This became, uh, this, fortunately in Michigan, they have collected data on fish species and fish communities in a very similar way for decades. And so they have a very rich database to work with on their fish communities. And what they did there was they came up with um, a metric. It was focused on summer low flows. And they said, um, and through a stakeholder process, they decided that a 10% change in the fish community, there's a number of different metrics and indicators behind that phrase, but a 10% change would be acceptable. Um, and they thought that's the way that the stream should be managed, if at all possible. And they found that based on this relationship represented here, that um, they could, on, on average, across the types of streams that they were concerned with, uh, remove um, up to something on the order of about 40% um, of the low flow condition before they saw that kind of a change in the fish community. Um, and so this is one example of a, of, a, of a curve, of a flow ecology relationship between hydrologic change and change in ecological condition. Here's a different one. This one for aquatic insects that was developed in Pennsylvania. Um, and this recognizes essentially different stream types because they're different stream sizes. They, they found that that was the most important differences in their stream types uh, in Pennsylvania and with relationship to these aquatic insect communities. And so they, they mapped out, as you withdraw more and more water from the system, how those aquatic insect communities, in this case, would change depending upon the different river sizes, the different basin sizes that, were, uh, that you were working in or concerned with. So I've now gone through how you might approach a site-specific study for an individual river, how you might take similar kinds of research and data and tools to come up with estimates for a regional basis, again, applicable to large river basins or to entire states, might be a very appropriate way of, of addressing um, environmental flow standards and using a regional approach uh, to try to get to that. The last one that I'm going to touch on, I'm going to call a presumptive standard. And the reason that we proposed a presumptive standard in a couple of papers in 2010 and 2011 was because, again, we recognized that even though we might be able to become more efficient by using a regional approach, time was going to pass before each state or each river basin or each country was able to do the kind of science required to set regional environmental flow standards or to go site by site, river by river. And we needed a stopgap. We needed a way of saying, OK, if you don't have um, any detailed science, what are you going to do? And so we took survey of how different site-specific and regional analyses were being done across the United States and around the world and summarized that and came up with what we called a presumptive standard. In other words, what would you do for if you wanted to be conservative and you wanted to be safe and you wanted to maintain ecological integrity in the absence of detailed science, what might you do? And so that's where the presumptive standard is all about. Um, it's based on this concept uh, that we call the sustainability boundary. Uh, Sandra Postel and I presented this idea of a sustainability boundary in our Rivers for Life book published back in 2003. Um, but we have been working on that concept and trying to bring it to life and trying to apply it to environmental flow problems 
uh, ever since, so for more than a decade. And conceptually, this graph represents the idea that you have the naturally available water or the natural or undepleted, undeveloped flow regime condition here. And conceptually, because you're trying to maintain the fullness of the ecological health and the biota that depend upon the flow regime, you might think about this idea of sustainability boundaries, that over the course of the year and for different flow patterns, there's a certain amount of alteration that you might allow to take place before you would expect to see measurable changes in the ecological health of the system. So that was the issue that we were trying to address when we came up with this idea of a presumptive standard. So this is just taking that sustainability boundary approach and saying, OK, so how much alteration? And based on, again, uh, the work that had done and our survey of that work, um, we proposed the following, that you can have a relatively high degree of confidence that if you're altering the flow regime by 10% or less, that it's likely that the ecological health of the system um, will, will remain largely intact. Um, if you wanted to protect a moderate level of, provide a moderate level of ecological protection, then you might think of a something like a 10 to 20 percent change in the flow regime, in the flow patterns. But again, stating that, stating that when you go beyond that 20 percent level, degradation to the overall health of the ecological system. And again, that, that may play out in very different ways. You might lose certain sensitive species. You might see species of certain aquatic populations declining. You might see invasive species or certain generalist species within the system becoming overly abundant. But you're going to experience more and more change the further you alter the original flow patterns beyond 20%. Um, a lot of these concepts, again, Sandra Postel and I tried to cover this in our Rivers for Life book published back in 2003 from Ireland Press. Um, we took stock of the state of environmental flow science and, and policy making as of that time. Um, much of the work that we reported on in Rivers for Life remains equally relevant and pertinent today, so it's a good Primer, for those of you that want to get more of an in-depth overview of, of environmental flow theory, logic, and policy, and water management approaches. And then I followed up with my Chasing Water book, uh, which was pub published a couple of years ago, um, that touches on the science and environmental flow considerations, but also goes much more in depth on water management and ways to work with water managers and policymakers to try to ensure that adequate water flows are left to meet environmental needs. Uh, this slide is just um, to offer the reference material that, that really would provides the basis for what I talked about in the webinar today, um, drawing heavily from a paper on site-specific approaches published in 2006. The regional approaches, the ALOHA method was covered in, in the paper um, from POP and others in 2010. And the presumptive standard uh, was summarized in a paper that was published in 2011, as you see there. So River Network is very fortunate to have a couple of um, very experienced and skilled and smart scientists um, that you can reach out to to learn more about these issues. They're working very hard to produce other webinars like this one, to provide online resources for you to draw from, and also playing a big role in shaping uh, the sessions, the training sessions that are involved in their annual river rally that's hosted by River Network um, each year. And so please draw upon all of these resources. And I wish you the very best of luck um, in your efforts to protect and restore environmental flows. Thanks very much for your attention.